what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. This podcast is sponsored by the 2019 Foot Candle Film Festival. This year's festival will be held September 27th through the 29th in Hickory, North Carolina. Learn more by visiting footcandlefilmfestival.com. Foot Candle Films. Film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Hello and welcome to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.TV. My name is Alan Jackson, co-founder and co-director of the Foot Candle Film Society and Foot Candle Film Festival. And with me, as always, the other co in that co-title, Chris Fry co-director, co-founder. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing well. Hello, podcast listeners. Yes, we have a great show today. We have two films that we're going to be reviewing in this, uh, our film podcast show here on the mesh.tv network. We'll be reviewing the documentary Apollo 11. We'll also be discussing the latest film starring Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn titled Dragged Across Concrete. After those two reviews, we'll be talking about our latest trip to another film festival uh, where we've been scouting out some films uh, that we want to bring your attention to. We'll be talking about the River Run International Film Festival in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and from that experience, highlighting several films that we both saw that we want to make sure you keep on your radar for the future. And then we will end the show with our typical recommendation. This is where we both have a film that we want to recommend you either try to check out now or maybe in my situation one you're going to want to look out for here in the future but overall this is our film review discussion show here on the mesh.tv we'd love to get your feedback and ideas and thoughts and questions and we'll explain after the end of the show how you can do that Uh, but we appreciate you tuning in chris how about let's go ahead and start right into our first review at the documentary apollo 11 sound good to you Let's lift off. Oh, that was very nice. Nicely done. All right, here we go. Apollo 11 has very simply been given the mission of carrying men to the moon, landing them there, and bringing them safely back. You can feel it in here when it's not. Okay, I'd like the colors. Don't know. No, I don't know. 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 I On our last episode, we reviewed They Shall Not Grow Old, a documentary that pieced together footage that was shot during World War I that famed director Peter Jackson had overseen the restoration of and in some instances colorized, and he used it to provide a perspective on the war using audio narration culled from like hundreds of interviews. With Apollo 11, we once again returned to a documentary formed by piecing together historical footage. This time, it was shot during the space race when the United States was trying to become the first nation to have a man walk on the moon. How did your viewing of this film differ from your experience with They Shall Not Grow Old, Alan, or did it differ at all? Um, It did differ. Okay. So They Shall Not Grow Old, I gave gave a, a passable review to and said I thought it was interesting. It was an interesting watch. I was more fascinated by the process than I was by necessarily the storytelling that was going on in the, in the documentary, this film, um, I'm uh, on board both technically and storytelling. I thought this was a, um, a, Ooh, I would almost want to use the word masterful documentary, but wow, that's probably that's... about where I'm going with this. <laughs> um, okay. I felt this was taking the same concept of all this old footage and kind of compiling it together to make a film The difference with Apollo 11 is that this is a true story that just like they shall not grow old, it tried to cover from the beginning of an event to the end. Mm -hmm. This one, we're actually following individual people, you know, obviously the, the astronauts that we've all got to know pretty well over the years, but it's recreating moments. It's recreating actual history from a different lens than maybe we've seen it before. And that's what I found to be utterly fascinating with this documentary. Um, the editing is really the the key champion here. 
Okay. You know, you could be presented with hours and hours and hundreds of hours of old footage. And, you know, you're at the mercy of how that footage was shot at the time and what you got and what you didn't get. To me, the whole success of this film is the editing. It was how do you put this, these hours of footage together to make it a compelling story and still build drama and tension, even though you know exactly what's going to happen. You know the end result of sure. this. This is well-known history. We, we know they walked on the men. Exactly. But to actually take such well-known history and still make it tense and dramatic and inspiring, mm-hmm. I thought was quite a feat. And so uh, somebody texted me after the screening, said if this film doesn't get not it doesn't get some sort of recognition for editing. And I know there's not a specific documentary editing award and the Academy Awards, but maybe some other award show there is. Sure. But I agree. The editing and the way this was put together was was pretty impressive. So I'm I'm big and high on this film. I'd love to hear your thoughts, Chris, because I know you were a little less impressed with They Shall Not Grow Old. We were both a little less than impressed, but I think you even had a little more concerns about it than I did. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this film. Yeah, I think it, the reason I brought that one up, just because, you know, recent history, we talked about They Shall Not Grow Old, and I think... I, I can't, being in the situation that I'm in, I can't say it was all because of hype, but I wonder if that actually does help it a little bit because They Shall Not Grow Old, I heard about prior to the Oscars, mm-hmm. like people were talking about it and you know, kind of clamoring about what a revelation it was and everything. And while good, I think you and I kind of set it on the same page that it was a good piece, but felt like more more like something that would be in a museum yeah. that you could appreciate maybe you know, chopped up into segments or something, but not necessarily as a whole. It just didn't, didn't work quite as a come together. Movie. Right. right. Yeah. Whereas with this, you know, I knew, I, I knew of the documentary Apollo 11, of course, because <laughs> I'm aware that people walked on the moon. I knew what it was about, but outside of that, I just really wasn't all that excited. I didn't know anything about it. I was like, mm. okay, it's a documentary about walking on the moon. But the mere fact, there were a couple of factors where there was something different to it. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't colorized footage because the footage was shot in color. So that wasn't different. But what was different was they didn't have any interviews. Yes. So not only no interviews at the time with people sitting down and like, you know, these interviews from 19, the 1960s. No, they didn't have any of that. They also didn't have any re- interviews of present day people reflecting back and mm-hmm. saying, oh, what a magnificent achievement. Nope. None of that. The only audio that they had was audio that would have been recorded for like conversations back and forth between mission control and the people in the space capsule or like news reports kind of like, you know, near like Walter Cronkite, you heard his voice, but you saw yeah. like footage that he was reporting. So it was all, I guess you could say like found audio it as was. well. Mm-hmm. None created natural specific, audio, yeah, natural audio, none yeah. created specifically for this documentary. Yeah. So the fact that like you're hinting at, they were able to take that and weave it into a narrative that was actually, even though you know the outcome, because of the editing, it was still engaging and interesting. And the score helped. I'm going to go ahead and say, I think the yeah. score helped a lot. No, like I agree. That. I think the, well, the score added emotion and tension to moments. And, you know, the, 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 that was one element that was created for, for the, film. the film, right? It was created now, modern day, but it was using instruments that were only available back in 1969. And it sounded very 1969 ish. <laughs> so, um, they tried to be as authentic with the music as possible, but that was something that was added. And I think did help the production. I, I, I would agree. I think it would have worked without the music, but it definitely added the level of emotion and intensity that I think really benefited the film when you had the music in there. And something that, you know, stuck out here again, um, the footage, you know, it's all original footage, but looking at some of the shots, you have to, I had to remind myself, this is not stuff that was shot for a film. Like, yeah. you know, to be, it was like, cause you've seen similar shots in you know, science fiction movies or in other things. And you're like, yeah, you know, you, they get the shot of the launch pad or they get the shots of crowds or they get the shot of, you know, these different docking procedures. And you're like, yeah, well, this is, you know, they set up these shots. No, this was just footage that was just like, okay, let the cameras roll and whatever's there is there. And they caught a lot of really good stuff. And they did a lot of cinematic things, not knowing if anybody would ever see them. Like there's these long, like pans of the control room with like all dolly these shots, dolly shots, know, all yeah. these people in there. And, you know, it's just, you don't, 
you see other things like that in movies, but you know, it's like set up for an effect or you mm-hmm. say, and you just something about the fact that it was real and these were real people in there, you know, many of whom are probably no longer around. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just really fascinating to see that. And it just looked so oh, good. Looked the amazing. colors looked really yeah. good. And it's just amazing because I had to kind of remind myself, this, this is real. This is not faked. This mm-hmm. is actually, I'm happened. with you completely this is caught authentically. I'm with you so, completely. There are two, and I'm not spoiling anything with the film. I mean, I think the film is experience. You can't really spoil it. But I will say there were two scenes, and they're both in the first 15 minutes of the film. Okay. But these are the two scenes that right away when I saw them, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm hooked. I'm already hooked <laughs> in the film, and I'm 10 minutes into the film. One is the very first shot okay. we see, which, again, you don't know what you're going to be experiencing because you've maybe heard, okay, it's all this found footage and restored footage and all. But the very first shot, you're at the ground level walking alongside as somebody, uh, a person is walking and he's walking beside a giant rolling structure right. that is basically carrying the rocket. Right. And at the first moment, you're, it's so grand and on the big screen and it's such a beautiful film quality. It's just cinematic. Mm-hmm. And it's also a shot you don't normally see. No. That's the thing is that you're, it's not a, it's not a, you never normally see the rocket being slowly tank carted down a road <laughs> to get to the landing spot. Right. But right away, you got the impression that you're seeing stuff that you don't normally see about this this whole expedition. And you're seeing in some really beautiful film uh, that was shot at the time. So that's one shot right away. The first frame, I was hooked. And then you mentioned about the natural audio. And you're right. Mm-hmm. Everything that we hear voice-wise was recorded at the time. There right. were some moments where we heard interviews with the astronauts but it was stuff recorded at the time recorded live right, right. maybe it was a tv special maybe it was something a news uh, conference or I don't like know. or there's like filmed footage of tv stations asking them questions right. and these cameras were there as well capturing all the questions so there so. was a moment where we see like really within the first 10 minutes we see the astronauts getting their ast- their their spacesuits put on mm-hmm. and you're hearing each of the three like you're watching them get their space gear put on right and the camera really focuses on their faces. And you're just seeing some heavy, obviously, contemplation. There's maybe a little anxiety, a little excitement. And you're hearing uh, an interview portion with them at the time, uh, you know, talking about what, they're, what they think the mission means to them and why they're excited about it. But instead of, again, using the, the standard interviews mm-hmm. and hearing nowadays, people say, well, you know, Neil Armstrong really wanted to do this because of this and this. <laughs> we mm-hmm. saw a rapid fire montage of just their whole life, almost like flashing in front of them on the screen. All of this footage, like from them as kids to them, modern day, their family and all that. And then it cuts back to them as they're still getting the space gear on. And that to me was so effective. It's like, you don't need to tell me how important this was to them. Mm -hmm. You show me in a 30 second montage, all of these shots of them in their life. And I get it. I mean, I know exactly why this is an important thing for them and why they're so the right people to be doing this. So again, they had the right stuff. They did have the right stuff. (laughs) It, it, It moved away from this idea of feeling like we have to tell you, through interviews, why something was important. We don't need to do that with this. We're going to show you Mm -hmm. why it's important in a very creative way. So those two moments in the first 10, 15 minutes of the film showed me this was going to be something different. And I really appreciate it for that. I think something else the film did that was, I it was just, they had a really clever way of constructing it where they kind of broke it down into what could be considered like heist events, although there's no bank robbery here, nobody's mm-hmm. stealing anything. Yeah. But they took events like liftoff, dropping of the first mm-hmm. stage, you know, the capsules reordering mm-hmm. themselves, touch down on the moon, lifting back off the moon, like all these, and they basically had clocks ticking. Yeah. So that kind of built like, okay, you realize they have this much time, this stuff's going to happen. And the appearance of the clock and the rapid ticking down, just along with the score that we've already mentioned, just kind of helped you know, <laughs> continue momentum and keep things going. And you're yeah. kind of like, sometimes are they going to get this done in time? You know, what's going to happen <laughs> yeah. if things don't work out right. um, and something they didn't shy away from, but here again, they didn't really focus on it was as the astronauts were going out to the rocket, there was something that was going wrong. It was mm-hmm. like a hydrogen leak or something pretty big deal. 
And, you know, they just kept on going out to the rocket. They went ahead and went about their business. We're just like, whatever. And, you know, yes, they figured out a way to get it fixed, but they just kept moving forward. Well, what was great about that is it was so realistic. It wasn't a Hollywood version of it where it's like, oh my gosh, the dramatic music and everybody's running around trying to figure out how to fix this leak. No, this is the way it really happened. It's like, okay, they're all talking to each other. Yeah, we have a problem. Here, let's look at the camera. Oh, yep, we see the guys are working on it. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're hoping they're going to get the fix thing fixed, but we're not going to slow down this other process. We have to get the astronauts up on the rocket. Right. So, again, it was realistic. It wasn't built up and, and made over dramatic uh, when it didn't need to be. You know, it, obviously the guys in the control room were pretty okay with where it was going and how that, that was being resolved. Um, you mentioned about the countdown, which I thought was pretty effective. Um, I love the fact, and again, I saw it twice with our audience Sure. because again, I wasn't going to watch it the second time, but I watched that first <laughs> five minutes and said, okay, yeah, I'm hooked again. I got to okay. watch it. That's always a good time. There's a moment, uh, one of those countdown sequences, I don't remember exactly which one it was, but one of them, you're seeing the, the countdown timer on the screen. And then at one point the red warning light starts flashing Oh, I know and you which hear one them, is. you hear them on the comms kind of talking about, yeah, okay. There's this, there's error message. People in the audience were gasping near me. It's like, oh my gosh, what is that? What does that warning light mean? <laughs> right. Again, this happened 50 years ago. We all know how it we turned all out. Know, yeah. But the fact that they made it to where we were so engaged and caught up in the moment was a real feat. So I, I thought it was amazing the way they did that. Yeah, that, I, I know. What you, yeah, and that was another instance of something's obviously wrong. And, yeah. you know, the music's there and everything. But you're just like, what? And then they just keep on trucking. Yeah. And yeah, that, that was, yeah, it was... Well done and very interesting. Something else that a different type of documentary might have brought these to the forefront and maybe been a little heavy handed with them, but this wasn't. There were other current events, obviously, you know, no event is isolated. So this is happening at the time of Vietnam, Kennedy stating that, you know, we want to go to the moon, kind of throwing out that challenge, Nixon's presidency, uh, Chappaquiddick, the incident Mm -hmm. that that happens. Um, the placement of minorities, both women and African Americans, within yeah. NASA, all these are present, but they're not in the forefront. And that yeah. was just kind of refreshing to see people. You know, you can notice them and pick up on them, but it's not like rammed in your face. Yep. And I, I like that. Yeah, I did too. And even to the point where the whole thing with the the Kennedys and Chapp- uh, Chappaquiddick. Mm-hmm. There's even a moment, I think two of the control guys in the rooms are even talking to each other. It's like, hey, did you hear about that thing with, you know, Kennedy and all that? And, um, yeah, you know, and the other guy says, yeah, I think it's kicked us off the prime time and that's been all over the news instead of us. And that was it. There was no right. political commentary. Yep. There was no like saying how, you know, critical it was that this was happening at the same time. It's just, this is the way they treated it. It's like, wow, we, we lost some airtime because this other thing happened. Yeah. yeah. I thought that was great. Uh, it was just, just enough that, to, to touch on it. You you mentioned um, we have touched on kind of, you know, all the found audio or the natural audio that was all recorded. If I had to mention kind of a downside, Mm -hmm. um, and there again, it's just a limitation of what was there. Um, Not as much when we were on the ground, but once we got up into space and specifically with the astronauts communicating back, a lot of times it got really garbled and frustratingly so because obviously you want to know what the guys are saying, but and, you know, in a way, I thought in the moment, I was thinking to myself, man, I wish they'd throw up some subtitles or something. But actually, no, because it kind of puts you in the place of mission control. Like, mm-hmm. I got to understand, try to understand what these guys are saying. <laughs> so, yeah. But in the moment, it was kind of frustrating. And I would say that was kind of a, I can't say it's a weakness of the film, but it was just a frustration for me. That it was a frustration. But was, I will tell you, having seen it the second time, I think probably, you know, obviously, I, I wasn't as concerned about what they were saying because I knew what was happening. Gotcha. But I think... Even despite that, and yes, it was kind of difficult to hear at times uh, the voices and what they were saying, the film still gave you enough information visually and other ways to know more or less what was going on. I don't feel like that we lost anything critical in the audio because it was hard to hear that we didn't make up for with what we were told later or visually saw on the screen. So, but yeah, I agree with you. It was tough. And I mean, again, I can't say it's a weakness either. It was you, you, you have what you have to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it did make the enjoyment of it, the, the viewing experience a little less than just because of that. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, I'll say kind yeah. of a closing thing for me. We've, we've mentioned, you know, the graphics as far as the countdowns and some other mm-hmm. illustrations that they did that I found helpful. One of the coolest things for me was actually the end title sequence. 
Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it just says, you know, Apollo. And then you see the names of like the astronauts. and You're like, okay, cool. And then what they do is they build out that list of names. So it becomes, and they start listing, you know, of course, engineers, all these other people. Everybody. Just, yeah. You know, hundreds and thousands of names. And it, that forms the 11. So yeah. it was like Apollo and then 11. And I thought that was a really neat title build such that, you know, and it's not like it's really complicated and all this like fancy CGI. It's just a really clever idea to somehow state like, you know, Apollo 11 was the people, yeah. the people were important and all these people working together. Well, I was going to say all the names were the same size. Yeah. So yeah. even though we saw the three astronauts first, first, they were only up for a second or so before all the other ones right. started popping in. And I think that really is kind of the intent of the movie, because even one of the last things we hear from Neil Armstrong in the film mm. is him thanking everybody that was involved in the project and listing out the types of jobs and people that were involved. And I think that really is what the film's trying to convey is that, yeah, we know the three astronauts, but look at all these other people. And they made such a point to list credits and names throughout the film of different people. Even if we were only going to see them for a scene or two, it's like, it was important to know who this person was and what their job was right. um, to see so many hundreds and hundreds of people involved in this project. It's pretty impressive. So, yeah. I agree. I'm incredibly high on this film. It's one of the best documentaries I've seen in quite a while. Okay. Um, so, I'm um, very high. It sounds like you're positive. I am. Yeah. yeah. I like it. As, I liked it a lot as well. Um, something that kind of stuck in my mind because we've had a dramatic interpretation of this event recently mm -hmm. with First Man. Yeah. <laughs> and it was interesting because I thought Ryan Gosling did a good job. I thought there were interesting shots in First Man. But overall, something about it just kind of, I don't know, I was just, I, I left wanting, you know. Yeah. And, you know, granted, the director, Damien Chazelle, you know, he'd done a lot of stuff like La La Land and Whiplash. So, I don't know, I was expecting more. There again, sometimes I guess expectations, which we've talked about numerous times on the show. But this gave me kind of what I was expecting first man to do. Uh, I'm glad <laughs> so. you brought that comparison because I can't think of two completely opposing viewpoints of the same event. True. Storytelling wise, everything that this film wasn't fear and dramatic, uh, backstory of all the uh, astronauts and, and what's focusing going on, in the on family. an individual. Yeah. Neil Armstrong. That was first man. And the one thing I said in the review is I felt like it misses. I got no sense of any optimism, joy, happiness, just from dread, this. just <laughs> constant dread. This film was the exact opposite. There were tense moments. There was worrisome moments, but at the end of the film, the astronauts are happy and mm -hmm. smiling. And you know, this is an accomplishment and they were proud. And it was just, I think you could pair the two together and get probably the total picture of what was going on at the time. Sure. And I don't think one should stand without the other, but I definitely like where Apollo 11 left me and made me feel about the experience more than first man. So, right. And both give you the sense that, Oh my gosh, I can't believe with the combined technology of less than what's in one person's cell phone, they were able to do this amazing accomplishment. Both of them kind of communicate the idea that, yeah, it's ridiculous that we ever got this done to begin with, considering this was way back then and we didn't have the technology, but yes, yeah, something about, yeah, kind of the overall feeling you're left with. There's optimism, hope, teamwork versus just kind of like, who, okay, yeah. we survived. That's you know? right. <laughs> so. yeah. I mean, even if I have to get very specific, sure. you know, both films have something to do and spend a good amount of time, at least uh, talking about after the, the, the mission mm -hmm. and the whole quarantine phase. Correct. Actually, probably the one of the most interesting comparisons between the two films. First man ends its last scene is the quarantine station. Neil mm -hmm. Armstrong and his wife, across the glass from each other not able to touch each other, but able to kind of communicate. And there's just this sense of, I don't, I don't know. It's, it, it was not a sense of happiness. It was not a sense of relief. It was just kind of this moment that was there between them. We have the same basic moment at the end of Apollo 11 through mm -hmm. the documentary footage. And it's, the kids are rushing in and there's a birthday cake, you know, that Neil Armstrong has <laughs> got inside the quarantine that his family's outside the quarantine, help him celebrate right. it's laughter and it's happiness. And it's just a sense of we did it and we succeeded again. I'm not saying one is more factual than the other because we don't see the other 99% of the time in footage during the quarantine phase. Right. Maybe there was a lot more of the drama and tension and other things going on, but Again, I, I liked where Apollo 11 left me a lot more 
uh, feeling about this event than what First Man gave me. But I do think they, they are trying to accomplish different things. Sure. So, yeah. Sure. That's Apollo 11. I think we're both high on the film. Uh, I do feel like it's it's worth checking out, even if you're not someone who feels like you're a big fan of NASA or the space missions. Just looking at what they were able to do with found footage and compiling it into such a compelling story, I think, is really worth a watch. So it has been playing in some select cities, uh, not getting a wide release yet, I don't believe, at the time of this recording. But I would uh, – it's a CNN film, so I would hope maybe in the next few months there at least be some time to see it online. I imagine, yeah. yeah. And, you know, if you can seek it out and see it in a theater, I would suggest it just yeah. because a lot of the stuff – you know, it's seeing a lot of these visuals on a big, huge screen. And, you know, space on a big screen is always cool. Well, and I would not be surprised. I know this episode will be released way before then. Uh, the actual date, uh, you know, in July. Hmm. Um, I can't imagine that they wouldn't have some way for you to see this film on the actual 50th anniversary of this mission. That's a good um, call. Because that's coming up in a few months. And I think they wanted this film released before then. So maybe there would be a way to show it on CNN or some other outlet on the day of the actual anniversary. So anyway, that is Apollo 11. We're both giving it some high acclaim here and recommending that you check it out. Now we're going to move to a film a little different. Uh, This is a film starring Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn, and it is directed by a Mr. Craig Zoller, and it is Dragged Across Concrete. Please don't move. There's an issue with the bus you made. How long is this suspension? Six weeks, no pay. Yesterday, I was a cop. Today, I'm a poor civilian. We have no right to compensation. I'm sort of okay with the idea. Who the hell are those guys? Things are getting weird. We're heading into new territory. Start the party. There's a lot of imbeciles out there. Chris, I can do the typical introduction of this film and give a little quick synopsis about how, you know, it's two overzealous cops who got suspended from their force early in the film. And then they kind of tiptoe into the criminal underworld a little bit to try to get some money because they're in suspension. They both need some cash right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've got two of them played by Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn, uh, both with interesting backstories as actors themselves, kind of having their own ups and downs career wise and maybe some more public, uh, public, uh, issues that, you know, got him a little attention, especially in the case of Mr. Gibson. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Mel Gibson starring as Brett Ridgman and Vince Vaughn as Tony Lurisetti. I could tell you all about that, but let me, let me set up this film this way. Okay. Uh, there are a small team of us that work here in our offices and we see each other every day. Yes. And I had one of those coworkers text me in the middle of the night one Hmm. night, just with an OMG. (laughs) And then he said, dragged to cost concrete. I initially thought, oh my God, did my friend somehow truly get dragged Dragged across across concrete concrete. and now he's texting me for help? (laughs) No, he was trying to tell me the name of this film and I had honestly not heard about it at all. And then a few days later, you're talking about it and say that you had seen it and that we need to review it. I said, okay, so now I've got two people around and me. And I end up recommending it on the podcast. That's right. You did. Yeah. You actually recommended this. So yeah. you've already talked about it uh, like bit. in passing. So that's my setup is that I did end up getting to see this. And I, I think I was the one who kind of came back to you and said, yeah, let's, we need let's to review this. this. <laughs> so my, my question to you, Chris is, you know, you recommended this. I did. I have a short attention span. (laughs) Remind me why you recommended this film a few weeks ago and why do you feel like it's still worthy of discussion now? It's to me, the short answer is um, it's what I wanted um, widows to be. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't widows was not, you know, widows was a, a crime thriller, but also talked about, you know, race and politics and these other things. And, you know, it was gritty, um, and had some twists and you couldn't quite tell where it was going. Maybe sometimes jumped around in time a little Mm -hmm. bit, but just ultimately it felt unsatisfying and it, you know, had an interesting cast. Widows did come to this, you know, Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn. The mere fact of Mel Gibson being in a movie nowadays, you're like, okay, he's going to try to make something that I want to watch. Okay, mm-hmm. I want to see what he thinks I want to watch. <laughs> um, but, of course, he didn't write the script or anything or direct it. That was Mr. Zoller. But um, something about 
Yeah, it is gritty. It is a crime thriller. It is a buddy cop movie or whatever. Mm-hmm. And yes, they do have some, you know, kind of funny banter, <laughs> but I didn't feel like it was ever overdone. No. And something just about where this film goes and the turns that it takes, it just, I, I really felt like it was something worth watching. And let's, I'll spend a little time on Mr. Zoller, um, which I may have touched on when I recommended it, but he's done two other films. Yeah. He did Bone Tomahawk, which was a, what, his take on a Western. And which that's I've, one you recommended. Which I've before. recommended mm-hmm. and I've seen. He's done one that I haven't seen, Brawl in Cell Block 99, that has Mr. Vaughn in it. Yeah. So I guess they got acquainted through that film. Um, but that was kind of a take on a prison film Mm because obviously the title gives that away. This you could say is his take on, you know, a crime thriller, police crime, police uh, procedural type, you know, type Mm -hmm. thing. And this is his spin on it. And to me, that's, what's kind of fascinating about the film. And Zoller is, he's kind of like a newer Tarantino where he seeks out a genre and puts his own spin on it. You know, mm-hmm. he did Tarantino did hateful eight. He did Jackie Brown, like a black exploitation kind of riff on that. You know, he does different like riffs on thing. You know, crime was reservoir dogs. You know, so he, he has his different takes on things. And I feel like Zoller's like a newer iteration of that doing things. And yeah, I, I like this more than I ever thought I would. Um, it is troubling in many oh, yeah. instances. There's a lot of graphic violence, oh, yeah. but I feel like, if you can call graphic violence even handed, like you, know, there's just, it's well distributed graphic violence. Yeah. And there's a scene which originally we'll, I'll get to in a moment, but I'm going to let you kind of respond. Mm-hmm. There's a scene that initially I had some misgivings about mm-hmm. because I thought it was unfair manipulation, mm-hmm. but upon further, I think I know what you're talking about. Upon further reflection. Yeah. I feel like, no, it's the way of saying, no, it was kind of the way of saying, no, I'm not just going to let you hit, sit here passively and watch this. I'm kind of, I did kind of set you up and then intentionally rub your face in it because yeah. I feel like you needed to have that done to you. Well, and I've got a theory on that. I think the scene I know you're talking okay. about as well. So, but yeah. let me hear, um, what are some reasons, what are some interesting things <laughs> you think about the film that you think you agreed to discuss it and watch it? So. Yeah. Um, no, I love this film. <laughs> I thought that was great. I uh, I ended up I watched it last night and I started I had to start late just for other things going on family sure. and house stuff. And it's a long movie. It's two it hours is. and forty minutes. And I had thirty minutes left, and it was like over midnight. And I'm I'm still riveted. Mm-hmm. I'm saying no. I've got to get up early in the morning. I've got stuff meetings in the morning. So let me table this and I'll watch the last 30 minutes, but all morning I've been excited about wanting to watch the last 30 <laughs> minutes of this movie. That's excellent. Um, it was great. Yes. Very violent, very upsetting, but I think the chemistry between the two leads. Yeah. Is so well done, which, you know, I could kind of, you know, in a way written Mel Gibson off. Like, I just don't think he's capable. Nah, he of was chemistry really good anymore. in this. I, I would agree. He's really good in this because agree. he played someone very grizzled who, you know within the first 15 minutes where this character has been and what his background is. But then we get introduced to his family Mm -hmm. and there's some great nuances about his family that you could almost feel like might be a little um, overplayed, but it's not. I mean, if you'd written it on paper, it sounds like it. And even to the fact of late in the film, he's having a dialogue with another character about his home situation. And even that other character says, are you telling me the truth about all this? Cause it, you know, almost it like it sounds, implies, like it a, sounds a little made up right. to get sympathy and it's not, but, and it plays it really, really well in the film. Um, so I like the chemistry between the two. I really like the fact that we get woven in and out of some different characters and subplots that some pay off and others don't. don't. And that's Okay. Although I think there's still a purpose behind every oh. one of those characters. It's yeah, from just, what you just said, I think the moment that I had <laughs> felt manipulated by you're talking about something not paying off. And I think ultimately when I look back and reflect no, on it. No, you do. Did. No, I, I knew it paid off actually later in the film. And I, I, we can do this without spoiling. A character is introduced with a little bit of a backstory played up like in a traditional film that this would be a character that's now going to become a primary part of the film. Mm-hmm. And something happens to that character where that character is not a part of the film pretty quickly. Yes. But what it does is you actually see and hear through one of our main characters later in the film kind of some impact that they felt like they let something happen. 
and they're realizing that that person, you know, even though they never met that person, there's still a indirect impact on them. Right. And we as a viewer are starting to see that, yeah, these guys kind of screwed up and kind of made some Majorly bad choices and did some things that impacted some other people's lives. And I, th- I think it added to the stakes of it. It absolutely did. And it was something where the director, I feel like, yeah, he's not going to let you off the hook. Like, Oh yeah, this is a crime drama. It's going to be cool to watch. Cause you're going to see how well they plan out this thing out and how it made the fact that no, these are, I mean, they're fictional people cause it's a fictional movie, but these were real people that whose lives were being yeah. torn apart. And he kind of realized, oh, yeah, we're doing this to get money. One of the police officers does, but then realizes, no, we're really you know, messing with some people's lives, and mm-hmm. we could have kept some We made a from decision happening. not to get involved somewhere, and if we, because we didn't, these other things happened. And there's real regret, especially on one of the main characters, I think, more maybe than the other. Both of them having some level of regret. The other one's just a little more perseverance about, you know, this is what we have to do. We have to just do. do He's got his eyes on the end goal of getting the money to help with the the situations of both of the cops. I'll say too, you know, going into this movie, I didn't know much about it, but I did know Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn. Those are two. And that's what you're saying. They kind of (laughs) do some interesting character development. Vince Vaughn and Mel Gibson are not the first people you see in this movie. Oh no. And it was just kind of like, I mean, it was, they were, you know, really revealing some plot details and talking about characters. And you're like, yeah, but where are the, where mm-hmm. are the two guys whose names are all over this movie? <laughs> and they do eventually come in and they do take the story yeah. over. But the way the director and the script that he wrote weave in characters and character development, I really thought was a really good instance well, of how you kind of understood where everybody was standing on certain issues. Well, if you think about it, the bookends of this film have nothing to do with our main characters. This is true. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty daring and well done. Yeah. Um, can I point out two things, two things that really made this film work for me? Sure. Um, one is even as realistic as this film is portrayed. And it's all about realism. I mean, we really do feel like that this is, you know, people making choices and in many cases, poor choices or, you know, kind of going with gut instinct as opposed to a more rational thought. Sure. A lot of realism involved, but yet the quote bad guys, um, especially two of them who are oh. just listed in the film as black gloves black. and gray gloves. Oh, I know. Who you, I was going to make a point. I about them. love them. Even though they are the most unrealistic part of the whole film in my mind, they're almost like treated like supervillains. I mean, they have like a mask. You never see their face. That is, that is amazing that you're making this point. Yeah. Because in my notes, uh-huh. I have Mask Gunman, one of the great villains in recent memory, yes. up there with Hannibal Lecter and Anton oh, they were so good Because they're so sadistic. Yeah. But they're just and it but I think the director, he uses them but also in a way that's like, it's this humor and it's this very dark humor mm. where they are just ultra violent. They don't oh. care how they're hurting people, yeah. but something in the way it's done. And well, the fact that we never, you know, I'm not giving anything away. We never see, we them. never get to see their face, um, which their is, mask, even though it's very tactical type mask, make them look like unworldly characters. Mm-hmm. And they just have this, I mean, just even the first scene we see of one of them just randomly just with the gun, almost like the gun is a, a tool, a paintbrush thing mm-hmm. that he's just using. It was amazing. Is that in the convenience store? Yeah. Yeah. And um, even there's a shot of shooting out one of the TV screens and like you see like the big spots on the screen where the bullets went in. It's left behind almost like a work of art he's left behind. It was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, I love the villains. There's a moment that, you know, I didn't know how I felt about it Um, initially looking back. I still like it It was probably the most non-realistic moment of the entire film, but I still got a chuckle out of it. Them going in to rob a bank and playing a tape player off their chest. And it's almost like they had their entire speech recorded, even with answers to questions they're anticipating. Right. Where it's just stopping and starting that tape player and miraculously it worked. I mean, it actually (laughs) played and said the things that you would expect them to say in response to other, their captives or their hostages, you know, and again, it could have been done so poorly, but the way it was handled in the film, it really worked. And it just added to their mystique and just added to this, this narcissism, this, this insane, insane, uh, level of, of, um, 
just not caring about anybody else around them. It, it just worked. So, yeah, I like that a lot. On the opposite side of the spectrum, okay, a scene that completely built this relationship between the two main characters to me. Late in the film, they're having a moment where uh, they're in a dangerous situation, and one of them is trying to uh, resolve something going on in their personal life and needs the other one to help them. Mm-hmm. And it revolves around their cell phone, needing mm-hmm. them to help them make a, a, a check, a voice message. Right. And one of them hands the phone to the other one and says, can you, can you uh, pull up my voice message and starts to tell them the passcode. And the other one says, oh, I know your passcode. <laughs> Right away, it's like, yes, that right. is, that is, those are partners <laughs> right. <laughs> right away. So all you had to say is, I know your passcode. Right. And then they play the message. They don't like what they hear in the message. And the other guy says, do you want me to just, just break the phone? And the guy's like, yeah, yeah, just break the phone. And sure enough, they do it. I'm like, okay, yeah, that one moment was one of the best personifications of police partners who know each other so well. And like, yeah, you don't even have to tell me your passcode. I know your passcode. Like, right. That's pretty cool. So it was, a, it was a nice little throwaway moment, but it said a lot about these two characters. When there were a lot of dialogue instances like that, that were still moving the plot forward, but that were just well constructed. And mm-hmm. I think that's what in a way kind of reminds me, but maybe even better than some instances of Tarantino where he does dialogue really well. And sometimes it moves the plot forward and sometimes it doesn't, but the scenes of just dialogue with not a lot of action going on are always interesting. Yeah. And there were conversations between the partner cops, between a newborn mother and a father, between criminals in a van after a bank robbery. Mm-hmm. Or, and there were different kind of hierarchy of the criminals in the van. And just the way things are said back and forth, kind of the ping pong match going on, very well constructed and very well done. But not not so heightened that it seems stilted. Well, right? and that's the thing. I think that's the difference with Tarantino. I agree. There's a lot of similarities there. Tarantino's dialogue is very stylized, sure, but it's for a purpose. You know, it's not just to be cool dialogue. There's actually stuff behind it, but it is very stylized. It's not dialogue. You normally would expect to hear in a natural conversation between people, but it works. Mm-hmm. This dialogue almost exclusively was stuff. Yeah. I could totally hear people saying to one another in these situations. Yes, we had a, a what could be considered a more stylized, these bad guy villain guys. But at the end of the day, they still played it straight and real. And there's a lot of realism in this film that you don't always look for in a Tarantino film. I don't go to a Tarantino film for realism. True. I go for stylized and dialogue and banter and, and the, the musical cues and all that. Now, this film has some interesting musical use. And did you see in the credits who does a lot of the music? No. He did. Really? Wrote it, and I don't think he actually sang it, but played instruments on it. Yeah, a lot of the see, music was composed for the film. And that's interesting, because I'd never heard any of the songs before. But they're all just playing on the radio, mm-hmm. or playing, you know, they're not, they're being played, what's, what's the word? Diegetic music. Diegetic music. music. Yeah. It's not piped in like popular music, you know, to heighten certain scenes. It's when they get in the car and they're cranking up the music, that's the songs you're hearing. So that was really interesting. And um, one of the songs is in the trailer and it comes okay. to, so if you watch the trailer of the film, that's one of the songs that I'm pretty sure he wrote and performed them. I don't think he sang in them, but I think he like just played guitar or something mm. like that. But yeah, there's mm. something interesting. Somebody who's obviously very vested in no creating this because the whole time I was thinking, I've never heard these songs before, but it works. They work for the film, but I'm just I'm I'm, I'm, I'm curious where they got this artist from. Well, so like well he <laughs> he'd made it himself. Sure. Um, and let me just call out and say that the timing where I had to stop watching the film last night uh-huh. and then watching it now, the last thirty minutes of this film, um, man. <laughs> Yep. A lot. I've there's never a stand, seen there's such a standoff a, that you kind of stopped at. That, well, there's the standoff, and that itself was pretty interesting and exciting. And you feel like, okay, this is going to wrap up, and then what's going to be the other 30 minutes no. I still have left? But like for another 20 minutes or so, there is a great. It, it, it's 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 watching two people figuring out a plan and having to decide whether there's trust or no trust in a situation, and it was played so well. Oh yeah, and it's just. You know, the whole time you're just watching to see who's going to crack, you know, in a situation. Uh, so well done. That yeah. last 30 minutes in general, uh, from the standoff all the way through the end, was very, very thrilling, even though it was quiet in a lot of places. I mean, it was, you know, you had some gunfire, but then after that was done, 
it's a lot of quiet moments, but it was tense and well done and just you kept waiting to see what was going to drop next and uh, very interesting. So, Alan, and, you know, kind of closing out our talk on it, um, you and I obviously are pretty high on this film. Mm-hmm. Our coworker in the office mm-hmm. that texted the OMG, <laughs> yeah. um, obviously he was pretty high on it as well. Why do you think this movie is kind of flying under the radar? Um, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the reasons okay. why I think it is. Um, Mr. Gibson. Yeah. I just don't he's think Mel Gibson is. Days. He's not an easy sell anymore. There are some very uh, strong opinions about Mel Gibson, which I, I understand. Sure. And that was going to call some people to question whether or not they really want to see anything he's involved in. Did you think, let me pause yeah. just for a second. Did you think there's a early in the film when he's getting you know on probation <laughs> oh, yeah. Don Johnson. By Don Johnson. Don yeah. Johnson plays <laughs> yeah. his like police captain or whatever. Sure. And he's kind of citing like the reasons why he's getting on probation. And he kind of references a phone call that was made that was like then thrown out to the public where he says things that he shouldn't have said. Mm-hmm. I oh, took I that was... to be a direct reference to Absolutely. the Mel Gibson phone call that got recorded. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, I think they're playing with that perception a little bit. I mean, he is someone that in the, in the film we learn early on had had a previous uh, situation where he was uh, showing racist tendencies, showing yes. uh, bigoted tem- uh, tendencies. Yes. And that was a plot point in this film of this character And I as thought well. that was very I interesting. I think Mel Gibson's a tough sell for people. It is an extremely violent film. Yeah. And that, that, that's going to be a tough sell for people as well. Um, so run, I think you can run time, right? Yeah. And then, you know, run time as well, two hours and 39 minutes. I mean, it's not a, a quick, uh, quick film to watch. I think there's a lot of factors going against it. And then, um, uh, you know, the other two films that this director made, neither one have really have set the world on hits. fire. They were, Correct. they were kind of more quiet cult, you know, niche favorites by certain people. So I think you add all that together. Um, it's a tough sell, but I will say it was. For me, a very rewarding watch. I, I'm really, really, I'm actually kind of itching to watch it again at some point. So, and actually, the OMG person said the same thing. Like he fin- actually he finished it, and it was late at night, and he immediately started watching it again. So he yeah. watched it two times back. To I back. actually think you know watching <laughs> it again, you know, because the film does start out, and, and you're not quite sure where it's going and what is why it's introducing the people it is, and but then it all makes sense by the end. It does reward a second viewing, I think. So. Yeah, great surprise. So thank you to you and our coworker on on recommending this film. So I we'll don't think say, I would have seen it thank before. Thank you, Brad Hess. Yeah, thank you, Brad. <laughs> uh, I don't think I would have seen it otherwise. So that's great. That is Dragged Across Concrete. Uh, you can see it on you know any digital streaming service that lets you rent films. So you've got uh, Apple iTunes, uh, Amazon, all these places where you can watch it. It is available now. And yeah, it's a tough watch. It's yeah, an upsetting definitely watch. Definitely a hard R. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But if you're in the, the mood for that and, and feel like you can handle that, it's, it's a great watch. I think a very interesting film. All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Chris and I are going to talk about our experience at a film festival, checking out some upcoming films that we think you might find interesting. And we'll close out the show with our recommendation of the episode. Stay tuned. You're listening to Foot Candle Films here on the TV. We'll be right back. This podcast is sponsored by Jackson Creative, a custom communication agency located in downtown Hickory, North Carolina, specializing in online content creation. To learn more, visit thejacksoncreative.com. Jackson Creative, we tell your story. Welcome back to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.TV, our podcast network is called the mesh.tv. If you're not watching this show or listening to this show already on that website, you can certainly look and find us online at the mesh.tv. Or if you're just wanting to learn more about foot candle and our film society and the upcoming film festival, I encourage you to go to footcandle.org where you can learn and actually see our podcast listed there as well as another way of watching and listening to our shows. But Chris, in lieu of kind of a more traditional news segment where we talk about, you know, productions coming up that we've read about, we're actually going to talk about films that we've seen, but are still going to be maybe a little ways off for some of the audience to catch up with. And that's because we recently attended the River Run International Film Festival in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. One that we try to go to, I think we've been there maybe six years in a row. I think that's right. And uh, we see typically maybe eight, nine films each during that long weekend we're there. And uh, we'd like to kind of come back and, and share some of our experiences. So overall, I had a great time at the festival. I think there were some really great quality films. But I've asked us each to maybe come up with three 
that we want to just kind of highlight for the listeners and let them know some interesting films we saw that obviously these are ones that we would hope are either going to be easy to find in the coming months or year. Uh, and we might recommend people checking out if they have a chance to see them. So Chris, why don't you tell us one of the, the three films you saw that you really think we ought to be watching out for here? Sure. So the first one I'm going to do is a narrative by, uh, I believe they're pretty much new directors, a pair of them, Andre Phillips and Carlos Volo. And the film is called Lupe. And I'll give you a brief description. A Cuban immigrant struggles with their transgender identity while searching for their missing sister in New York City's underground sex industry. So hmm. obviously this is a heavy film. Sure, right. Um, well shot, well acted. And um, I don't want to say too much about it because it's different from any other film and actually documentaries on people that are struggling with uh, gender identity or something. There's something specific about this film that kind of gives you an interesting uh, viewpoint. And I, 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 there's, it stands out. I, I guess the main character you never feel like is a victim um, because they're always – I'll, I'll say they. Mm -hmm. this person living in New York City – is a uh, physical trainer and specifically trains people how to kickbox and stuff. Hmm. So this, you never feel like this person's in danger because you know, this person can beat the crap out of people. So sure, it's right. kind of an interesting hmm. thing because interesting it's like not playing that. the victim yeah. or something. So it's, it's just really well done. And that was kind of an interesting take on something that just, I don't know I hadn't seen before. So that's uh Lupe and uh, it probably is still making the festival circuit for a while, but um I would recommend checking it out if you have a chance. Interesting. Okay. That was one. I'll, I'll go ahead and mention one here on my, my side, a film I saw. It's a documentary, and it's called The Raft. Um, it's about a, a – obviously, it's a documentary depicting a true story. 1973, five men and six women were put on a boat, a raft, to drift across the Atlantic. And it was all part of a science experiment, uh, studying sociology of violence, aggression, and sexual attraction in humans. So we have a, uh, a researcher who decided to put together this experiment, drafted the people to be on this boat. They all volunteered to be on it for the course of this, this uh, experiment. And they're riding around uh, on this raft for 100 days across the Atlantic. Wow. Um, I'm not going to get into detail about what actually happened between these people, but it's maybe not what you would expect. And actually I think that's part of the interesting side of the documentary is that it did play against some of the expectations that maybe we've gotten so used to hearing about on reality TV and all these other game shows that we see. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Not only was it a lot of archival footage that was obtained that was shot on the raft back in 73, but they actually recreated the raft oh, in a wow. studio okay. and brought the people that were on the raft together, all the ones they could reach, to come together and talk about their experience while sitting on this replica of the raft, which was kind of a neat way of looking at it. So hmm. I I liked it. Um, you know, well, it, it, it had some some things I wish it had done a little more with. But I will say it was just worth watching just for the interest level of, of kind of if you're interested in exploring a sociology experiment between people in a very unique situation. I think this film did a good job of exploring that with us. So that's The Raft documentary. Uh, it was released in Denmark in September this past September, but it's just now making some festival circuits now here in the United States. Well, I'll follow up that documentary and recommendation with the documentary that I got to check out at uh, the River Run Film Festival. It's called While I Breathe, I Hope. It's directed by Emily Harold. And um, this plot description kind of sums it up. What does it mean to be young, black, and Democrat in the Southern Republican state of South Carolina? Do experiences of politician Bakari Sellers, While I Breathe, I Hope, unravels that question. Hmm. So, yeah, it. It's exactly what that setup says. It follows him around different campaigns that he's working on, talks to people that have known him his entire life. And it was, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, it will be interesting as well to see where Bakari Sellers ends up in the coming years. Does he turn into a, you know, a major power player in politics? Who knows, mm -hmm. but he's definitely got some, uh, interesting background behind him. And this, if you like politics, um, 
then you should, I think this is one that would be interesting to check out. Oh, yeah, that does sound really interesting. That was one I was hoping to catch a, and, and just couldn't make it work in my schedule. So, um, so I'll mention another film. This is a narrative film. So we're kind of alternating here back and forth narrative film called Sophia. And this is one that was also released, uh, in France back in September. Um, and, but now is also making the festival circus here in the United States this spring. It's about a 20 year old girl named Sophia who lives with her parents in Casablanca and then following a denial of pregnancy where, uh, uh, she finds herself actually illegally giving birth to a baby out of wedlock. Cause that is something that was again, is against the law okay. to have a baby out of wedlock. What that does is kind of set a situation in motion where it has some, changes uh along the way some some plot points that you maybe don't expect to see and what i liked about this film is that it it just really took us on the journey of what happened after finding out she was pregnant Hmm. very unexpectedly and delivering a baby and it doesn't go in the direction you would expect it to um actually i think the main character is pretty fascinating some of the decisions she makes and some of the things she does or doesn't do and all the other people she brings into this situation and their role in helping her, trying to help her be on the right path and make this all right. But um, it gets complicated. Okay. I'll say it was surprising because it, it doesn't uh, – we don't have a main character that we necessarily feel as sympathetic as we you feel like maybe you should by the end based on some of the choices. So gotcha. I thought the acting was really good. I thought – uh, where this film decided to go was very interesting and very nonconformist. So uh, I, I liked it a lot. French film, Sophia, uh, should be coming out here soon and some more festival circuits and available online, I would say, probably in a few months. Great. Right. Mm-hmm. What'd be guys a third film? So my third was The Sound of Silence uh, by first time director Michael Taberski. And it stars people. This is one, you know, festival film that had some big stars in it. It had Peter Sarsgaard, Rashida Jones, Tony Revolori. So some names you might recognize. Revolori was in uh, Grand Budapest Hotel, if you're wondering who that is. <laughs> but um, you'd recognize him if you saw his face, for sure. Plot description behind this one. A successful house tuner. That would be Mr. Skarsgård. In New York City, who calibrates the sound in people's homes in order to adjust their moods, meets a <laughs> client with a problem he can't solve. And the client would be Rashida Jones. So um, just an interesting concept behind the movie. And um, I, I liked it. Very subtle to me, the first, the setup and the whole idea, which, by the way, House Tuner doesn't really exist. It may now after this film's come out. But, but That uh, was really disappointing for me to hear that that, that job actually doesn't exist. really exist. Because it me, sounds fascinating. Right. It's just such a cool thing about world building that they were able to establish that kind of the setup and some of the things reminded me a little bit of a, a lighter version of like a Charlie Kaufman idea um, with some of his like eternal sunshine, the spotless mind that was, you know, he didn't direct it, but that was kind of his idea. Synecdoche in New York, some of these like real cerebral weird things, kind of the setup of the movie kind of reminded me a lot of him with the exception of this is a little lighter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it doesn't get as dark and heavy and depressing as some of his stuff can sometimes get. But um Kind of an odd movie. Uh, the pacing may be troublesome for some, um, but I, I liked it. Uh, the Sound of Silence. Okay. And let me finish up with our my last uh, of three films I, I want to kind of call some attention to. <laughs> uh, so I got the pleasure of seeing uh, one night at the festival a film called Freaks. Oh. And what was maybe led up to believe was a, kind of more of a horror movie, a little more scary turned out to be very different than what was expected and watching it with a crowd of people that I think were all expecting one type of film and then kind of came out realizing it was a whole different type of film hmm. was also a very interesting experience. Um, the description for this is in this genre bending, which I agree genre bending psychological science fiction thriller, a bold girl discovers a bizarre threatening and mysterious new world beyond her front door after she escapes her father's protective and paranoid control. Stars Emil Hirsch, and we also have Bruce Dern in here. Um, it's not perfect. It's got some moments that may be a little eye-rolling and later in the film. If you're not on board with the film by about the three-quarter mark of the film, yeah. you're going to hate the last quarter of this film. Okay? <laughs> okay, So you have to be on board with it and realizing where it's taking you by the yeah. end. I can't wait to see this film. This one that, <laughs> due to scheduling, I didn't attend the same screening as you and yeah. I would see something else and... Afterwards, I was kicking myself from your description of having again, seen Freaks. 
there are going to be a lot of people watching this film and it gets towards the end and you're just like, I don't like where this is and this is not the film I wanted and I'm really up. And me, I loved it. I was actually the one who led the applause afterwards on this oh, film. Wow. Playing. So Leading the charge. I had a good time with it. Excellent. I don't think it'll get a huge audience many other places just because it's, it's a little hard to market without telling what kind of film it is. Hmm. But um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say about it. Freaks. Uh, with Emil Hirsch and Bruce Dern, directed by a pair of people, uh, Zach Leposki and Adam Stein. Uh, I think maybe the first feature film together. So, okay. yeah. So that's six films right there on the spot that Chris and I caught up with at the uh, film festival recently. All of them should be in some way, shape, or form available to either hopefully catch online or see in a theater in the coming nine months, 12 months maybe. Um, but they're all ones we think added something to the festival experience and are ones that we would like to keep the radar on because they're good films that we had a good time with at the festival. Okay. So Chris, that was anything else from, from the film festival experience? No, I know we're headed towards recommendations, but I'm taking freaks as a recommendation for me. I'm definitely going to seek that one out. (laughs) I just want to, I just want us to talk about it after you see the fair enough. And just if you liked where it it went by the end of the film or not, because okay. even the last shot of the film is one that you're either going to pump pump your fist and love it, or man, you're going to say that was the campiest worst way to go with this film. Wow. Yeah. Okay. All and right. I'm curious which direction you think it goes on this. Okay. All right. Well, Chris, let's wrap up the show here with what we do every episode, which is we give one recommendation, a film we think you ought to check out, or, you know, we try to make it one you can always find available online. I will go ahead and say that I'm cheating a bit. Okay. And I'm mentioning one that you're not going to be able to see right away, but hopefully it won't be too long before you do. Um, I'll go ahead and jump into mine if that's sure. okay. So, because it actually dovetails nicely off of River Run. It was another River Run film. Uh, I didn't give it as one of my top three because, uh, you know, I think this is a film that I'm going to recommend that's probably going to be available sooner than these other ones or maybe a little more accessible in the coming months than these three were because this one has some actual big star power and is a little more uh, accessible to a wider audience than maybe some of the other ones I mentioned. The film is Ode to Joy. Um, It had one of its earliest screenings at this film festival we went to. It is by director Jason Weiner and written by Max Werner and Chris Higgins, based on a story from WBEZ Chicago's This American Life, a show that many people are very familiar with. It's a tr- based on a true story, but a little bit of an adaptation of that story. Uh, Charlie, who is played by uh, Martin Freeman, uh, suffers from cataplexy, a symptom of narcolepsy that causes sudden bouts of paralysis whenever he experiences strong emotions, in this particular situation, joy. Hence the title Ode to Joy. So here you have a character that every time he feels a a overriding sense of joy, he passes out. So obviously you could play this for comedy, which the film does. The film has some funny moments with this. But then you start to ask the real question, how do you even sustain a relationship with someone you're in love with when you're constantly feeling sense of joy and you're constantly passing out? That's really the premise of the film is we talk about relationships. We have uh, Marina Baccarin who plays Francesca, who is someone he becomes infatuated with and admiring. But obviously there's a challenge there of how do you build and sustain a relationship with someone when you keep passing out on them? Um, the film, you know, it has some fun moments. It, it plays the comedy at times. But what I really liked about the film is it actually does explore a solution he tries to work through on how he can be in a sort of a relationship with her, but yet suppressing joy the whole time he does. And it was kind of an interesting solution to it. And I think the film does a good job of showing that this is something he is doing to help counter his situation. But obviously, you, you can you know that it's not going to end well the way she's playing it. Sure. So um, I will say some of the, some of the humor maybe is a little forced at times. I thought the supporting character, Jake Lacey, who plays his brother at first was really cliche and kind of over the top, but he actually does kind of redeem his performance later in the film with some nice moments. Jane Curtin is in the film, has a small role. Uh, Melissa Roche, who you may have seen on big bang theory on TV, has a very funny turn. So it's, it's, it is a romantic comedy, but it's just a little notch above your standard rom-com to where I think it had a little more going for it. And just the premise alone is really interesting. And Martin Freeman is great in the, in the lead role. So if you're in the mood for a romantic comedy, 
this one comes across your radar, I do think it's worth checking out. I think it's a fun watch and a, a lighter fun watch, especially compared to some of the other films we, we saw at the film festival. So <laughs> that's my recommendation. Ode to Joy hopefully will be available at least online or somewhere else in the next few months. Chris, what have you got to share with us? So I'm going to recommend a film that uh, premiered, I think, in 2018, but I think it actually came into U.S. markets in 2019. So uh, it's called The Breaker Uppers, and it's directed by a team of ladies, Madeline Sammy and Jackie Van Beek. Uh, I got onto this film because I saw Taika Waititi, who mm. we've talked about before, yeah. you know, director that we both like, most recently did uh, Thor Ragnarok. Mm-hmm. He helped produce this film. Okay. And so it kind of was like talking up on Twitter, like, hey, you know, here's another some New Zealanders that I support or, you know, check out their comedy, whatever. Hmm. Um, the storyline for the film is two women run a business breaking up couples for cash. But when one develops a conscience, their friendship unravels. And oh. the tagline is breaking up just got easier. <laughs> um, so, yeah, these these two women run a business. And they go out and break people up on per like one person wants to break up, but the other one doesn't. So they make it so that it's like the person wants to leave you. You know, it's just, wow. it's, That's and funny. you can see, and it's, it's, it's funny. Um, and the fact that these women, these women wrote, directed it, and they star as the two women in the film. Oh, wow. So it's, okay. it's cool for that reason. I caught up with it on Netflix, which I think because of like distribution mess is probably where you can catch up with it right now. It's probably mm-hmm. only through uh, Netflix, maybe. But you may be able to find it eventually through another avenue. But that's my recommendation, The Breaker Upperers. The so. Breaker Upperers. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Had not heard of it. But, you know, nowadays on Netflix, there are so many films. I, I it, it used to be you knew when a new Netflix film came out on Netflix. Now I no. have no idea. New ones are being released every day, it looks like. So. True. That's great. All right. Well, that's our recommendations. Ode to Joy may still be a ways off before you can see it. Uh, and, but the Breaker Uppers is available now on Netflix. Correct. So just as a recap, Chris and I reviewed today in our show Apollo 11, both very enthusiastic reviews of that documentary. We reviewed Dragged Across Concrete, also very enthusiastic reviews of that dramatic film. Uh, we gave three films each that we caught up with during the recent River Run International Film Festival that we think you ought to keep your eyes open for in the future, and then our recommendations as well. So, a lot of positives today. We didn't really yeah. have much to complain about with any of the films we talked about today, which is kind of interesting. I mean, I could rag on the new Hellboy, but I won't. No, let's we'll save that for another <laughs> another time when we need something to balance out all the good. We can mention some of the misgivings and, and, and things that we've have not cared for as well. So, all right. Well, I like ending on a positive note. Nice, nice, big positive show. That's what we're going to do here. Chris, if anybody's listening to the show and they've got some feedback for us or things they want to, maybe they've actually seen some of these films. They want to add to the conversation. How can they, how can they reach out to us? Send us an email at info at the mesh dot TV and mention foot candle films in the subject line. And yeah, tell us some of the information that Alan mentioned, whether it's, your opinion on some of the movies we've talked about or movies you want us to check out that you want us to discuss on the show. That's a good way to get in touch with us. Uh, Something you can do for us, dear listeners is uh, subscribe to our show. If you just happen to be listening on the the mesh.tv website and you haven't actually subscribed to our show through iTunes or one of the other services, please do that. Uh, In addition, if you happen to be on iTunes, leave us a star review or some comments or something because that helps us reach more listeners. Absolutely. Sounds great. Please do that. Please help us out. Check us out on TheMesh.TV podcast network, along with other shows available for your listening pleasure. And this has been Candle Films here on TheMesh.TV. Until next time, take care and thanks for listening. See you in the ticket line. Special thanks to Carpal Tuller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Tuller, visit www.carpaltuller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.